Somebody today asked a question if she has ice cube trays that she uses during the year and she and she washes them in with her sponge, her cleaning sponge, which is hummet stick basically, and I guess hot water and soap. Yeah. Can she still use the same ice cube trays on Pesach? So we're going to take a poll. Nancy says no. I see her saying no. Milton, no. Also no. Anybody else? No. First, okay, Mark says no. <laughs> Oh, uh, what do uh, you say, Fran? I say no, but I also say I've never washed my ice cube trays. <laughs> <laughs> I know so I was going to ask her, maybe give us a lesson <laughs> in washing ice cube trays. Well said. Anybody else say no? Raise your hand. No. Is, no. Wait, are you saying no, Sabina? I'm saying no if she's washing it with her hummus sponge. Right. Now, that's anybody that's else? If she's washing it with a clean sponge, it's water. Right. No, no, no. Of course. Of course. We're only talking about what this comes up. Ah, we have another, we have another man, maybe. Jean, Jean, what do you say? I say no. Also because of the sponge. Okay. Well, that was her question. I think she knew that if without the sponge, although believe me, many people who, as you pointed out, don't wash their ice cube trays and just use ice, ice cube trays for water. I never, don't think I ever washed mine. I don't, I don't feel like they ever needed it, but I obviously- Maybe. Yeah, you could use handy wipes. Thank you, Mark. So then many people, even if they never wash their ice cube trays with a hummet stick sponge, they would still have Pesach thick ice cube trays, even though clearly to everybody here, that's not actually necessary. So we already understand that there's like a feeling inside about what is appropriate to move from hummet stick to Pesach thick. And I just want to be aware of that. And I want to hold that as we move along with the halacha. Because what I'm teaching now is what is the halacha? What's the halacha? What does Jewish law say about koshering your utensils, your um, appliances, your mostly your kitchen, basically? I don't know what else there is to kosher except for that. Anna, question. Yeah, I had a sort of similar question because it's water-based. How about the hot water urn that we use? Great, great, or great. It's perfect because if you, again, if you're on the WhatsApp group, but you can always go to the bayit.org slash Pesach and we have links to the same files that I'm that we put on the WhatsApp group. You can just click on them, and all those kinds of answers, sorry, all those kinds of questions are answered. And what I do is, if I get a new question, like I just got a question about the ice cube tray, I would enter that into either my general file or into an FAQ, frequently asked questions. Maybe it's not something people you know necessarily need to know as a rule. So guess what, guys. I'm going to teach you something that's going to surprise everybody. You're all wrong. I'm sorry, but you do not. It's not a bad thing. You could use new ice cube trays, but you don't have to. And let me explain to you why. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't. You want to buy new ice cube trays for Pesach? I have no issue with that. I won't. Really. I'm not, I'm not one to tell people do something that doesn't make you feel good. But if you want to know the halacha, the halacha, let me explain to you, which might give you a, which might also give a lead and a window into the things. Oh, there we go. Jeff is here. See, who said that men don't come on? Go, Jeff. <laughs> That'll give a window into the things that have to be koshered, can be koshered, cannot. Because we never put chametz and heat it in the ice cube tray. There is no way for the chametz, if even if there was a little particle of chametz in your sponge, you're not heating it in the ice cube tray to a level that it can get absorbed into the walls of the plastic. Because, right, once you wash it with water, you don't see any chametz. Do you agree? You can't see. I mean, a yeah, piece of bread fell in it. Uh, I don't know what else. And then you wash it off. It's gone. You're not going to drink it on Pesach because it won't be on your ice cube tray. The only problem you might have which would be the reason that you couldn't use that ice cube tray on Pesach is if you put in hot chicken soup or hot something. Like some people do that. Remember there are, I don't know if you know about this, but it's kind of a trick, a hack when you have babies and you, oh, Nancy's smiling, right? And oh, other people, Sabina, great. So what happens is you can put like hot food or any kind of food theoretically into the ice cube tray and then it comes out as you freeze it. And you have exactly the right amount to give your baby if they only eat two ice cube trays full, for example. Hi, Wendy. So if you put something that was cooked in a hummus stick pot, like I'm just throwing out vegetable soup, even though the vegetables may not have any hummus in them, 
Everybody follow me. If I say something you don't know, please stop me. But remember, if the vegetable soup was cooked in a pot that was a hummus thick pot, there might have been flavor of hummus in the walls of the pot. And when you cook it, it's the heat that infuses or diffuses the taste. So now let's go back to the ice cube trays. If you only used water in them, I'm not even talking about like it's possible even if you put juice in. I mean, that's also possible, but because it's cold, so it's not going to get absorbed. You need something to kind of force the taste into the ice cube tray. If you wash an ice cube tray every day, which you wouldn't, but if you wash it every day with a hummus stick sponge, it still wouldn't absorb any taste of hummus because it didn't use any cooked hummus food. It didn't get heated. But if you used it, for putting in, you know, um, portions for a baby or something like that, then don't, because then you don't know, right? So then we say, we don't even take a chance. So I think this was a really good way to enter the world of what needs to be and what doesn't. And it's really important, everybody, to remember, we have many, 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 many customs. Now, some of these customs feel very beautiful and some of them feel onerous or onerous? Onerous. It's onerous. Some of them feel onerous. And then if we need to do them, we need to do them. But if they feel onerous and you don't need to do them halachically, I would love to be able to give you permission to let them go. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so now let's talk about preparing the home. Okay, everybody, like that was like a nice kind of way to enter into the world of how, what switching over hummets. And I mean, I, I do have a file. The file is eight pages. But the reason it's eight pages, it's really, really cute. I'm just going to share it so you can see it, but I'm not going to put it up. If I sent a link, would people be able to click on it or does that not feel comfortable for people? Is it better to put it up on the screen? So if you have the link. I'll put it in anyway, right? I'll it. do both. I'll do both. I'll put it up so that people can look at it by themselves any way you want to have it. In fact, I'm going to go to the buyit.org slash Pesach but I don't know how to share that with you. I'm sorry. So I'm just going to do it and tell you um, what I'm doing. The buyit.org, right? That's our website slash P-E-S-A-C-H, Pesach. That's where all, everything you need to know about Pesach is there. And on the bottom, there's a whole list of halakhic guidelines, four of them. I'm going into the first one, which is called preparing and kashering for Pesach. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Please, 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 please. Ask questions as we go along. It's really important because if you don't ask questions and you have a question, you won't know the answer. And I am here to answer your questions. Let's see if this works. Yes. All right. People see this? Yes. Yeah. Can make it a little bit bigger. I'll try to make it a little bit bigger. Okay. I'm right. actually skipping over the first part, which is about checking. I'm just going to skip over it right now because this is really more about about um, getting your home ready for Pesach before you get to Erev Pesach. I just wanted to show you that even though it's eight pages, I put pictures in. So when you put pictures in, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that to be silly. I really mean it. Because first of all, you know that if you want to know about plates, you'll jump to here. And if you want to know about pans to here, and if you want to know about a refrigerator, you jump to here because there's a picture. So it just makes it a little bit easier to navigate. I think eight pages of words without any pictures can just feel like I, overwhelming. I don't want to think about it. You know, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, all right. I'm, I'm actually going to, oh, wait, you wanted me to put the link in one second. But everybody, you know what? You can, do, are you able to do that? If you're able to navigate to the buyit.org slash Pesach while we're talking, or does that feel uncomfortable? Because I can put the link in. So one second. Because I really, we, we don't need to have the file the whole time. Just a minute. I want to explain to you a lot of the process. So just a minute. Here we go. For those who are a little more tech savvy, I'm going to drop into the chat. So if you open your chat function, I'm going to put in there for everybody a link and you can just click on that link and you will get to that same file. Okay. And you can always go to just the buy it. Pesach. Okay. 
let's imagine our kitchens. First of all, let's talk about everything. Let's talk about for a moment, everything other than the kitchen. Everything other than the kitchen. Does anybody have a suggestion what you need to do outside the kitchen? And let's assume you don't have a freezer. I have one in one of my bedrooms, but <laughs> let's assume you don't have a freezer outside and you don't have a garage. I'm talking about outside of kitchen appliances. What do you need to do to get ready for Pesach outside the kitchen? Any thoughts? Milton says, check your toiletries. So that is true. We're going to get to that. Very good. We're going to get to that on Wednesday at the food prep. So the thing about toiletries, except for maybe lipstick, since you don't eat it, you're really not allowed to have um, things that are edible. So I'm not saying you don't have to check it, but um, we're going we're gonna to get to that. Makeup. Very good. So we'll talk about that on Wednesday. So thank you. So check your toiletries. Yes, Sabina. The car. Oh, the car. Yeah, the car is very important. If you eat in the car or anybody does or you leave food or could have fallen out of your groceries, I mean, a whole year went by. Very good. You have to clean your car. Good. What else? Yes. Judy. Well, I think a lot of people eat, eat in their bedroom watch. So I think you have to really. What do you have to do? So so let's say that's true. Uh, let's I don't say, know. Oh, I, mean, I, I mean, all you have to do to deal with that, from my point of view, strip the sheets, wash everything, vacuum around or sweep, and you're done. I mean, I just okay, want to make, it make sure there's no, you know, no you know, protein bars or candy correct, or anything. Correct, You have to do a scan, 100%. So what else would you do? You'd have to check your knapsacks, your pocketbook. Even, I remember one of my jobs as a child was to go through the so coat bad. closet. Was to go, once. Wendy, did you say something? I said pocketbooks and tote bags because- Exactly. The, I found yeah. random, you know, a pack of gum here, a power right. bar here. And by the way, you could do that today. You don't have to wait till the last minute. Just don't put any chametz in there between now and Pesach. So there are many things you can do ahead of time. It's but already I was done. Say, That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> right. Yeah, fair, Wendy. Lovely. So what I had to do, one of the things was to go through the pockets of the coats. Just go, why? Because you might have a candy, although the candy is probably kidney oats. It's probably not chametz, mamash, real chametz. But, um, but you go through because you might have a candy bar or a cracker. Right. You might have a cookie or a cracker because it's been a year. So you might have something in there. So that's what else? Dining room area. So you need to clean it, but, and you need to look around. You need to maybe, maybe move your furniture. It depends if you have young children. If you don't have young children, most of us don't drop Cheerios behind the couch anymore. I mean, most of us, at least on this. But I would agree that if you have young children or if you're helping one of your children or somebody, who has young children, you might want to move the furniture a little bit. You could even like take off the seat cushions from the couch just once. And again, you could do that already now because in the next two and a half weeks, I used to give my kids, once I cleaned areas, I used to give them what's called matzah shira cookies. I don't know if they sell them in America, but they sell them in Israel, which are not hamet stick, although our, it is our um, custom not to eat them on Pesach. It's... Um, it's matzah mel made with wine or egg into a, not matzah mel, flour made with wine or egg and not rising 18 minutes. We don't generally eat that unless you have a reason of health reason. And then I knew that even if they dropped a crumb or they dropped a cookie somewhere, it wouldn't actually be hummus stick. It would be pay something. Other than that, is there anything else that we need? Pantry, yes, a pantry closet. So that's part of the kitchen, but it might be outside the kitchen. I agree. Good, good. You have to go through your pantry. Very, you know what? The pantry is a good lead in because often the your pantry office. is outside the kitchen. Yes, Wendy. Your office. Your office, if you have an office at home, right? And people work from home. So again, but that's just, that's scanning it. It's scanning it, cleaning it, looking behind things, but just once. You don't have to kosher anything. I'm just putting it in perspective. That's all. I'm not saying it's not important, but that could easily be done three weeks before, two weeks before, and just be careful not to bring chametz in there afterwards. Or if you eat chametz, eat it over a plate. And don't drop, you know, look around, make sure you didn't drop anything. I just want to make sure that this is clear. I mean, I love that. Who, who said the car? You said, somebody said the car. Car was great. Don't forget the car. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> and... um but other, and if you have a storeroom, I guess. So let's now move to the pantry. Okay. 
in the pantry, first of all, it is truly worth going through your stuff because so many things can be kasher le Pesach, right? They're often it says OUP or OKP on it and you didn't even realize. Or there might be some foods like quinoa. There are ways to buy quinoa ahead of time. Let's say it's an unopened package and we, we'll get some, we get to food. But you want to check it. You don't just need to close all the food. Of course, we try to get rid of our food as much as we can so that we can fill it with Pesach thick food. But the pantry needs going through because it has real hummets in it usually. Okay. So you probably need to, in any case, take everything out, wipe it down. It's nice if it sparkles, but if it doesn't, that's okay. Because remember, schmutz, sturt is not hummets. I'm not saying you shouldn't clean it. You should do what you feel right. But if somebody is working or doesn't have a lot of time or energy or doesn't have a cleaning person to do it, it's not about making ourselves sick and cleaning things that we don't have enough energy for. And then we would get to Pesach kind of, in Hebrew you say al-arba, which means on four, meaning like, like you can't even stand upright. So I just want to encourage people to focus on what's really important. So now we're moving into the kitchen. Anybody have questions so far? Mark doesn't have any questions. Anybody else have a question? Okay. Unless there's something here for a plastic thing. Like uh, plastic plates. Plastic plates. Yeah, you need new ones for Pesa. Oh, Pesa. Yeah, for Pesa. Ah. Okay, so now let's talk about what needs to be replaced, meaning into Pesa big things. What can be kashered? And how do you kosher it? So I think we could start with appliances. How does that sound? Let's start with appliances. Skipping over this, I'll come back to them. Appliances, starting with the refrigerator. I hope everybody understands from what my from my introduction that the the refrigerator and freezer cannot inherently be hummet stick because you don't cook anything in it. But what can be, and probably is, unless you're really spotlessly clean, there easily can be hummets in there, crumbs, literally crumbs. I think a spill of tomato sauce is, I mean, I like to clean things up, but not everybody does right away. I like to spot clean. And and we don't want anything hummet stick that may have been stuck to a, a shelf in the refrigerator to stick to a Pesach thick pot and then somehow maybe get, you know, connected, somehow get infused in our hummus food. But once you clean the refrigerator, you're done. You're finished. You don't have to line the shelves. Not only do you not have to, I mean, if you want to, you can. But once it's clean, it can't transfer any taste. Just clean. Just take out the shelf, wash it and put it. I mean, I'm saying just like it's no work. It is a little bit of work. I don't mean to say it's not work. But once it doesn't have hummus food in it or or crumbs, I think the hardest part is like in the freezer to get behind the basket and get literally get hummus to crumbs out. I'm actually gluten free. So if we didn't have hummus, anything that I have except for my oat rolls for Shabbat is always has no hummus in it because it's not made of any of the grains that are hummus stick. So everything I'd have would be kidney oats and um, kidney oats like corn or rice, things like that. We don't eat them. Ashkenazim don't eat them generally on Pesach, but you don't have to sell them. So it's not wouldn't be as much of a problem. But that doesn't mean I don't clean the fridge. What I'm trying to say is that you don't have to line the fridge because, and you don't have to kosher it. You don't have to pour boiling water over it. You just clean it. Now, what happens if you have items that you're selling, either kidney oats, I mean, we will go into what kidney oat is on Wednesday, but let's just take it for granted that people have heard of kidney oat. So what happens if you have hummets or that you're selling hummets things or you have kidney oat that you don't want to use on Pesach, so, but you need to keep them in the fridge or freezer? What do you do? This is not a trick question. Anybody could unmute and say. Do you double wrap it? And you could double wrap it. Really, the most important thing to do is to put it in something that's opaque. You don't want to see the roll, uh, theoretically, or the whatever it is that you don't want to use. Because there is an issue, not only can't you find it, you're not supposed to see it. Because then it could be enticing. Yes, Sabina. I put it in, uh, I keep a separate drawer. A what? A what? 
Oh, I, I lost you. Uh, do people lose me or do people hear me? No, we hear you. Sabina, you back? Lost you now. I'll, I'm going to resign in. Okay, resign in. We'll we'll make sure yeah. she gets on. Yeah, go ahead. Carol, did you? Anybody else want to say something? Um, about I put it in aluminum foil. That way, I can't see. Aluminum it. foil is great. Brown paper bags are wonderful for that. And I put wonderful. it in the back of the refrigerator, so I put it in the back of the fridge. You don't want it to freeze, so you got to be careful. Sometimes, what people might do is take one of the drawers and just fill it and cover it with like brown paper or put it in a paper bag. Mm -hmm. Sabina, mm -hmm. you back with us? Yeah. Uh, no, soon. So yeah, any way I, of doing I put it in I put it in a drawer and if necessary I put it on a shelf and then kind of cover the shelf with aluminum foil. Right, you can't right. Throw all, everything out. Right. No, no, exactly. And all of these are really good solutions. As long as it's closed and I uh, if you cover with tin foil I assume you won't open it. I like to mark it. That's just a thing for me. I like to have it marked comments in some way whatever that means. Um but the refrigerator in general, if you cover shelves in modern refrigerators, it is not good for the circulation. It's not good for your food and it's not good for the refrigerator. So if at one time people covered this, remember the shelves used to be different. It wasn't good for them either. You had to make holes in them. Remember they were grates. It is not recommended as a rule. Now I'm not saying it's possible you'll cover your shelves and everything will be fine. I'm not one to you know tell you don't cover if that's you know, my mother did it, my grandmother did it. I've done it my whole life. How could I stop? I'm not going to argue with anybody about that. It's extra work. It can be, you know, a little, I'm, you know, I say annoying or I don't know what the word would be, but, but you don't have to. And I'm here to tell you what you have to do and don't have to do. I'm not here to tell you what your min hug is and what feels right to you. Okay. I remember the first year that I didn't cover my refrigerator. Every time I opened the refrigerator, I went, oh, it's not covered. Oh no, it's okay. Like my brain had to go through it every time if the first few days, because I guess for whatever reason, I'd always covered until I learned that you didn't have to. Maybe my mother had the same thing that she also thought she had to because her mother did until they learned and didn't. Okay. So that's the refrigerator. Okay. Everybody good? Refrigerator, same thing with freezer. So it's usually, you know, you have to defrost it. I mean, it's really, it's not the most fun thing to do. I wish my freezer was frost free. I'd be much happier about that. Um, I'm still looking for a freezer that'll fit into the very narrow space that's frost free. Hasn't happened yet. Okay. <clears throat> Stove tops. Okay, so this is a little more complicated depending. Now, just I want everybody to know that I don't see everybody. So if you want to say something, please feel free to just unmute and, and ask a question. Now here it's a problem because remember what I said, how does taste get transferred? By heat. There's lots of heat on your stovetop. So there's a there's a um a halachic precept kibolo kah polto. The same way bolea means to swallow. Liflot is to spit out, like a baby spits up. That's called liflot. The same way the 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 material absorbs it and brings it inside, the same way we're going to get rid of it. Okay. That doesn't mean you're going to physically see it. It means that whatever the process is that the tape, again, we're talking about clean things. We're not seeing any chametz here. We cleaned it. You don't actually see a Rice Krispie. Rice Krispie is probably not chametz, but you don't see a Cheerios. Cheerios is mamash chametz because it's made of oat. It's not like you see a piece of chametz. You cleaned it, but maybe the taste, probably taste got infused because so much heat happens around the stovetop. So we need to do the same heat to let it out, to let the taste out. Everybody with me? Great. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is there's another halachic precept that says noten tam lifgam, which we call natlap. It's just a cute acronym. Means that it has a taste that was spoiled. And it doesn't matter if this is true in real life and you say, oh, 24 hours, it's not spoiled, it is spoiled. That is one of our halachic precepts. So therefore we want any taste of chametz that might have been there. When we say spoiled, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's spoiled like with mold. What it means is it doesn't have the original taste. It's less tasty than it was 24 hours ago. So what we do is we wait, we clean it. I like to clean it before waiting 24 hours. Somebody told me, you know, I was told that you can also wait 24 hours and then clean it. I don't know why that doesn't feel good to me, but that's just me. But it can be either one, Gene, or whoever's talking. If you can just go on mute, unless you have something you want to say that's awesome. Um, 
So we wait 24 hours. Again, that gives this noten tam lif gum. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not true for stove top. My mistake completely. I apologize. Oh, let me walk that back. You do have to wait 24 hours, but not for this process. The reason you don't have to do it for this process is because we're going to be burning the taste of chametz or burning the chametz out. That's helpful in other situations. I apologize. My mistake. I'm saying, where's the 24 hours? Oh, right. You don't need it, actually. So libun, and libun means uh, burning or firing. Libun is the process that we use. It's the process that we use in order to let out the taste that might have been absorbed when the fire was on. So let's first take a gas fire, okay? Yeah. All parts of the stove and stove top must be well cleaned. Uh, guys, you know where I am? I'm number 10. You with me? Okay. The grates of the stove top should be flipped. Why? Because then we're actually burning the top of the grate where the pot was touching, okay? After cleaning thoroughly underneath, the burner of the stove should be turned on high for 35 to 40 minutes. Coils, so the coils, that's in the case of a of an electric one, but it's either one, uh, electric or um, gas. The grates do not need to be covered. If you have a self-cleaning oven, you can put the grates in the oven before you turn on the cycle, but you should know that it may discolor them. This process is known as libun kal, which means light firing, even though honestly, it feels pretty hot. Like your kitchen's gonna be pretty hot when you put on four burners or five, we have five burners on our stove. And remember, you want to turn over the top so that they get very, very, very hot. And again, that's how it lets out, so to speak, the taste of any chametz that might be in there. Now, I, in general, yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I would okay. recommend, from speaking from bad experience, I would recommend doing two burners at a time. Yes, we hundred percent. We, we have many people now have a microwave built in above their um, above their stove we actually partially melted our microwave that was less than a year old because yeah, we had them yeah. all at once. It's too it's, hot. Even it's with too the hot. Fan As a matter of fact, we had a similar problem and not that it melted it, but it turned on a fan and we just realized it's too hot. And with same yeah. thing, thank you, Wendy. Thank you so much for saying that a hundred percent. So we also do two at a time, which of course means it's 40 minutes times two, but you know, that's just the way it is. Thank you very much, Wendy. But, but Wendy is be, always, be, always be good tips. In your microwave. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's not worth melting we your microwave. We literally had to replace it. We melted it, literally. Oh, so hard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If food falls on the stove top during Pesach, we don't eat it. We always say you can't really get it hot enough. You'd have to literally burn it. Libun, what's the other word? Libun hazak or something. I think that's you take a blowtorch. There is a way to do that also. We don't recommend that. We're in apartment. Like we don't have room to do that. And we're lighting fire. So if any, so here's the thing, if food falls on your stove top during the year, you might, you know, possibly pick it up and put it back in the pot A noodle fell out. I don't know. Of course, we're not usually having noodles on Pesach. You don't do that on Pesach. On Pesach, we consider that trafe land. The, again, that's the stove top. Everybody with me? Anything that's in your pot, of course, you can have. Um, as Rev. Jeff pointed out, my Rosh Hashiva, this is a general, Rabbi Fox, this is a generally healthy principle but we are very, we're more stringent. I want to say there is a strong custom to be more stringent on things on Pesach. Even if we're a hundred percent keeping kosher during the year, there is something about being more stringent on Pesach that just, that's what we took on ourselves to be more careful. Now, there was a custom to put tinfoil. I used to do that a long time ago. Not healthy, not highly recommended. Because if it goes near your burner, it could actually go on fire, believe it or not, tinfoil. So it's just better to just not eat anything that came out of the pot. Something, you know, bubbled over or something spilled. Okay. Usually a whole pot of food doesn't spill on your stovetop. Everybody with me on that? We just want to keep safe. It's really more important to be safe. Now, if you have a glass corning halogen or Ciran, I don't know how you pronounce it, Ciran is Ciran electric. That's more complicated. To kosher the burner areas for Pesach, you turn on the elements of the stove till they come to a glow, but the rest of the cooktop cannot actually be kosher because you may not, you can't burn them, you can't really make them hot, and you can't put tinfoil on them. And using a blowtorch could 100%, you know, um, 
burst it, you know, break the glass. So basically what you do is you turn on, again, you, oh, here you don't have to leave it 24 hours. Sorry, I keep forgetting that. Clean it well with whatever material you use to clean it. Turn it on for 40 minutes on till, or just till it comes to a glow, it says. No food that comes on that stovetop should be eaten during Pesach. Why? Because that stovetop had heat and it could easily have absorbed chametz. And there is no way for you to heat that to an extent that it'll holet, spit out the chametz taste. Everybody with me? Now that's not a big, you're not giving up a lot. Like, not like this happens all the time, right? You don't have food bursting all over your stovetop. It's just something to keep in mind. Okay, are we good on stovetops? Great, oven. Again, clean every part of the oven with a cleaning material, including the door. For example, oven cleaner, baking soda, fantastic. Please use caution when applying chemicals to continuous cleaning ovens. I have no idea what that means, but if you have one, you might know. But if you, you, if you apply chemicals to a continuous cleaning oven, it might ruin the special surface coating. So be very careful and you should be able to clean it with a lighter. I mean, again, unless somebody never cleans their oven, so then it gets very, very, very dirty. It may be necessary. By the way, this is true of the refrigerator as well, which I did not say. Very often the refrigerator pieces just come out and then you have, you know, seams inside. You have to clean it all because they have hummets in them. Because, you know, over the course of a year, I mean, even if you clean, some people are totally spotless. Most people can't, you know, can't keep up that, keep up with every single crumb. And sometimes it's, an, you know, it's hard. You have to take out the drawers and clean the shelves. When you're, when you're cleaning for Pesach, you really have to take everything out of the refrigerator as much as you can. You have to go nuts. If it's impossible to get to, just clean it from the outside. As Mark said, you might want to use um, handy wipes yeah. or something similar, right? Uh -huh. Lori got the most beautiful haircut, Lori. You look I very good. You, good. you look amazing. Yeah, look good, right? You both look good. It's true. Mark looks good as well. Yep. Yeah. So That's you clean it all. You may have to take out pieces. That's very possible. As with all pestle cleaning, a visual inspection is necessary to make sure, I'm on number 12, to make sure there are no grease spots, which might be removable. If you have a self-cleaning oven, that's a good option. Although many people have told me when they put on their self-cleaning, it breaks, it trips a circuit. And I don't have much experience with that, but I never use self-cleaning. Um, you can leave the, even though the instructions generally suggest that you don't leave the racks in, in a self-cleaning oven, when you're kashering your oven, you basically have to leave the racks in or get Pesach thick racks. Otherwise, you have to take a blowtorch to them, and we're not doing that. We hope to move away from blowtorches. If it's self-cleaning is not an option, you can run the oven at its highest setting for 30 minutes to kosher it after cleaning. All right? How are we feeling about our cleaning so far? Are we feeling okay? Mark yeah. feels good. Awesome. Yeah. I just want to stop sharing for a moment. Everybody good? I just want to make sure I don't have any puzzled faces here. Does this feel clear? Again, we'll have copies printed out. You can look online. I'm not hiding anything. It's all in that file. <laughs> Just reading what's in the file. Everybody good? No questions so far? Cool. How are you doing, Gabby? It's Gabby Taylor. I'm good. This will be my like third year of PESA. So Amazing. This is just making sure I don't miss anything. By the way, Gabby is in a television set. It's kind of glamorous. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. <laughs> I enjoy it every week when I see it. Okay. So we have covered so far, not literally covered, just covered the topic. <laughs> so we've covered the refrigerator, the freezer, stove, and oven. Now we're moving to the microwave, which most people have, not everybody, most people. So convection, I don't even know what that means, convection microwave oven. Does that mean that it can also bake? I, I don't know what that means. I only have a regular one. They're, but if you have one, you know you have one. They're treated very similarly to regular ovens. They should first be well cleaned, then run on the hottest setting for 30 minutes. Though in a regular oven, one can use meat and, mil and milk at different times without covering. These ovens have been assigned to one, what we call gender, meaning dairy or milk, milchik or fleshik, because it's smaller. That is an issue of kashrut, where same thing as a, as a toaster oven. You Toaster oven cannot be used for either, for both dairy and meat. I'm not even talking about the same time. You can't make hamburgers in it and then later on in the day make cheese toast. It's either meat, meat or dairy or parab, obviously. And that has something to do with the size. I'm not going to go into that now. But the because the convection microwave is like a very small oven, basically, um, it has one gender. That gender can remain uncovered when cooking. When choosing to cook the other gender, those dishes do need to be covered. 
Oh, I guess you can do it. Just have to cover that. Okay, well done. I don't know why that's in there. Maybe that's just helpful to people who might not know that halakha. However, when you kosher it, it resets to zero. Let's say you use it for meat and, and for Pesach, you want to use it for dairy or the opposite, uncovered. So it gets reset because you're taking any taste that was absorbed is disappearing. Everybody with me? Regular microwave ovens. Now this, because you're not using heat per se to burn the chametz out, you actually have to wait the 24 hours because you want to make sure that it is not lap, no ten tam lifgam, that any taste in it is what we call spoiled. First, you clean the microwave, you let it stand unused for 24 hours. That is a very, very, very strong rule. What you should do is for this year, since Pesach is Monday night, just use Shabbat. Shabbat, it won't be used for 24 hours, no problem. You can kasher it Saturday night. Everybody with me? <laughs> I don't know. Um, and here's the thing. Usually, if you're not doing Shabbat, if you're doing it during the week, it's easy to forget and use the microwave. You have to not use it because you have to give 24 hours for this taste to get spoiled, what we call spoiled. So what I do is I put a piece of masking tape. I actually write the time on it, 12.09, if I'm you know, doing it on a weekday. And then every time I go to use the microwave, of course, I see that. I, it reminds me not to use it. Place a microwave safe, safe glass of water inside. Run the microwave for seven to 10 minutes until steam fills the inside and kashering it. Here's the problem. The one place where steam didn't touch it is? Glass. Nope. Yes, but no. It okay. didn't under the cup, Judy. Well, that's what I mean. Under the oh, cup. Sorry, you I didn't understand. You had the glass, so you have to move the glass. All right. Oh, you gla oh, you're right. You're right. Under the glass. I thought you meant the glass thing. Yes, yes. Very mm -hmm. good. Very good. So um, you have to move the cup to another place completely separate and... Um, and uh, move the glass, move the cup, and then do the whole thing all over again, so it again fills with steam. All right. So, so I have a question about microwave. The turntable cannot be kashered. Yes, we hold that it can be. You hold that it can be. Yeah. So it's a glass turntable. How do you do that? That's how you do it. You clean it. You leave for twenty four hours. You, that's the koshering. Also takes care of the plate inside, but on Pesach. I, I didn't write that, but maybe I should write that. Not to put food directly on there. Put it on something. Like in something. No? What are you saying no to? Sabina. You I mean, never put food directly on the turntable, ever. No, you never do, but some people do. Oh, especially okay. teenagers. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Trust me. It always goes in some sort of a container. Yeah, yeah, I agree for me. I agree for you. I have absolutely seen with my own eyes people who put it on. I don't understand it because it makes crumbs, makes no sense to me. Like, makes why would mess. you want to? But, you know, whatever. Okay, and so okay. at first I hear that you can actually use the turntable in the microwave. I didn't know that. Okay. I mean, I will double check, but this is the way we hold, this way Rev. Jeff holds, we follow Rev. Rabbi Fox okay. as well. But okay. I will be glad to double check on that. No, no, I, I, I'm going. No, 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 I'm don't double check. I'm don't just saying I didn't know that. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I also didn't know for a while. I, actually, I didn't know the opposite. I didn't know that you couldn't. But many, many, many people hold that you can. Not everybody, but many do. And I'm not. Sorry, without. I always thought you put something on it, like. But you don't have to if you're putting. I mean, you could. Right. Oh, you mean okay. put like um paper towel on it and then put your cup on the paper towel. I, what I usually do is I just like cut a piece of thick cardboard and it fit to fit like into the, the plate. Also, that's yeah. really I mean, if you have any qualms, yes, you could do that. Yeah. Okay. I have a quick question. You just mentioned a little off topic, but you mentioned about the toaster oven. Yes. Um, is either meat or dairy or par. And then, right. but also that was new to me that like, I have a dairy toaster oven that let's yeah. say I wanted to, for some reason, make something neat. If I wrap it up, I could do that. Twice. I never knew that. You have to double okay. wrap it. It's almost like a non-kosher oven, you're saying. Like right, exactly. Thank you. And the way to remember um, what to do, this is the way I always tell people, like when you yeah. say, wait, can I bake dairy and meat at the same time? In my, like I'm, I'm rushed for time before Shabbat right. and I want to make something dairy next to something meat in the, my oven. As long as you one of them is double wrapped, you can. 
completely really? double wrapped, uh, just like mm -hmm. on an airplane. Right. How What's is it that, that on an airplane they can heat up our food next to the tray food? I'm not even talking right. about like kosher dairy, kosher meat. The only right. reason you're allowed to is because our foods are double wrapped. Mm. Now, I'm not saying you want to do this. You might be uncomfortable. I get that, but you can't. What What about an air fryer? Uh, I don't know. That's a great question. I'm going to write right. it down. I believe they cannot be kosher. No, no, I have, I, we, we got, we got one. I finally joined, the, jumped on the bandwagon. We have not used it yet. We said, oh, maybe we'll use it first for Pesach. Um, the question is, does, is it an air fryer meat or dairy? Can it be used? That I don't know. That is a whole question about air fryers. I am not that well-versed. I will be happy to it's look at it. It's a new, a new technology. It's not, right, it's right. not, it's, it's also not in the old book. Yeah, I, I don't have one of those. I actually either. somebody gave me an air fryer, but it was so big with two drawers, I couldn't fit into right. my kitchen. I had to give it away. Right. They were very happy, right. by the way. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm thinking of getting an air fryer that's small, but I believe uh -huh. it can be one gender and right. um, eating milk. Like and and I, can, I don't, as I don't far as I know, it can't be kosher for peso. It can't be kosher. Once you set it, right. you're done. Yeah, and I can't. I don't think that there's an option for something to be wrapped. I think it it, it is whatever it is. Oh, I'm just reminding. Oh, right, Rob Stephen is reminding me that some people he usually uses this Zoom ID to for his class. So if somebody came on for his class, um, don't look, don't feel so bewildered. I'll give you the Zoom where he is. Thank you, Rob <laughs> Stephen, for reminding. He sent me a message. I'd forgotten about that. If somebody came for Rob Stephen's class. Did you come on for Rev Stevens' class? Anybody here? Yes, came on? I did. I did, Peter. I did. Oh, hi, Peter. So, um, hi. but I so like your you class as well. <laughs> well, it's a different gone. kind of. My class is on kashering for Pesach, and Rev I Stevens know, class. but I need that too. So, I... <laughs> so whatever you want, you're welcome to say. If you want Rev Stevens, um, I have to give you his his Zoom ID then. Okay. Oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. But if you want to stay on, that's fine. Obviously, you're so welcome. I'm staying on now. Okay, well, that works for me. Okay, um, how? So I'm writing down about. I would say, unless you hear differently from me, I would not think that you. Wait, somebody said they also came on Judith. Yeah, Judy? but as long as I'm here, I do. I I want to switch to the other class, but as long as I'm here, I actually have a question uh, on yeah. Pesach. Uh, since sure. you, I I sort of fell into this by accident, but um, I don't know if you guys talk, if you talked about it or not, but. If I have a, a electric water thing that I never clean with anything other than- Oh yeah, that's my uh, question too. Towels mm -hmm. and never use anything other than water. Can I use it? Right, so you missed the intro to this class. I'm yes. going to give you the answer and I'm also going to tell you that any questions like that, because you're going to be getting off, we have a, um, a page called hey. thebayit.org slash Pesach. Okay. One second, let me just put people on mute. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, and on there, we have on the bottom left, all our files I did that tell you exactly how to prepare for PESA. So you'll okay. be able to help. But I don't mind skipping and answering that question. I just have to figure out how to get the um, the link to Rev Steven to you. <laughs> so one second. So um, you we can put it in the chat, Rev. No, I will, but I have to figure out how to copy it. So give me a minute. Um, I, uh, okay. Thank you, Judy. I'm just... I can't do that at the same time that I'm answering the questions. Let me first answer the question, Judy. Okay. Uh, Judy or Judith? Brilliant. Judy, brilliant. Yeah. I wrote you today. I think I wrote you an email today. So you asked about, are you with me, Judy? Hello? Judy? Judy. Uh, so this is coming in and out. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. Are, am I like that for other people too? No, no, you're good. Right, uh, so no, we're you're hearing good. you clearly. Okay, so Judy, a hot water urn, if it only had hot water in it, it doesn't even matter if you washed it. Clean it, and then you'll see, I have it in the file, but basically you run it through once, you pour boiling water on the spout, and it's it, because it just had water. There was no hummus. Right. Thank so you. the hummus I... could not get absorbed into the walls because there was no hummus. Now- if you heated up chicken soup in it, that's different. No. <laughs> or noodle soup. Now that would be a problem right. because noodles are hummus. No, I just have to Except convince my wife. Noodles, of course. 
Okay, I Judy, just have you to want convince to my wife of that. What? Yeah. Matzo ball soup is definitely, well, unless you made it for Pesach, it's chametz stick. Mm. All right, you're going to have to give me a moment to find Reb Stevens and give it to Judith. Just a moment. Mm. Here we go. Um, Judy, is is it helpful? Hmm. If you put it, can you hear me? Um, I can hear you. One second. I'm just copying it. Yeah, try to copy it. No, my problem was copying it. Hold on one oh, second. Actually, it's not going to work because I just click when I click on it, I keep coming here. No, yeah. I haven't given it to you yet. No, it's a new Zoom ID. <laughs> it's a different Zoom ID. You you keep clicking on the one that you usually use for him, which is this one. I'm right. giving you a new one right now. There you go. I put it into your chat for you, Judy. Like, I see it. You can click on and then we'll probably, you'll wink out of here. I, I'm okay. sorry I'm taking all your time. It's because my computer is slow. It's coming up now. No problem. Okay. All right, friends. So you already got your answer for the hot water urn, but we're going to go over it anyway. We'll go in the file. We're going back. Wait, where's my file? Just a moment, guys. I lost my file. Just a minute. Hmm. Not there. Nope, not there either. Where is the file? Oh, I lost my file. I apologize. I will find it, but I haven't found it yet. Ah. Ah, oh, there we go. Found you. Can't run away from me. All right. Okay. Back to our file. Um, so we spoke about microwaves. Now dishwashers. I don't actually have a dishwasher, but if I had one, I would 100% cash it for Pesach. So, the, so again, with dishwashers, there are a wide variety of customs. Some people say... You can't kosher it. If that's who you want to follow, that is your choice. We're telling you that if you ask us, we will tell you a way to kosher it. And we believe is 100% okay. You should inspect for any specs of actual food. You know that, right? There are older models where you actually have to check the trap and you have to remove because it could be literally pieces of hummets that get trapped. Everybody with me? Right? They don't all disintegrate, even if they don't taste good anymore. You have to clean and like to any pieces that are inside, make sure you get rid of them. You have to wait 24 hours because remember, we're not firing it with heat. We're running hot water. Whenever it's about running hot water, which is haga'ala, that's just the word that's used. Then you have to wait 24 hours first because it doesn't actually burn out the chametz. It's whatever it does. It's not the same process. So you have to wait 24 hours for any comets to be, as we said, spoiled. Then write, then run it on its highest setting with soap. And we recommend not green or edible soap, meaning not the green soap, but actually something that would ruin the taste that you wouldn't be able to eat so that any comets that theoretically was left is ruined, right? You, it doesn't taste like you would be able to eat it. Everybody with me on the dishwasher? So again, with the dishwasher, you want to put a masking tape on it say exactly when you started 24 hours. Now I can imagine that if somebody had Shabbat and then they wanted to wash everything in their dishwasher. So even though the dishwasher rested on Shabbat, you have to start your 24 hours again. So then use it to wash all your stuff at midnight or 11 or whenever you finish, you, you start your 24 hours, then Sunday night, which is the night before Pesach, you can kosher it. Everybody with me on that? Did that make sense to people? Okay. So, Bro Brock, I have a question about dishwashers. I was always told that you can kosher if it's stainless steel inside, but not if it's the old fashioned plastic inside. Well, Judy, if you want to follow that, that's okay. There are no, I don't, but I want to. Well, there are different thing. opinions. So here, here's how to kosher a dishwasher for Pesach, regardless of the material inside. Okay. Different people hold different ways. Okay. All right. I, mm -hmm. I know what you're saying. I, look, I get it. There are different psaks that that's okay, but we follow this one. Truthfully, one of the things that we do is if we have, let's say, four different places we could look for a psaq, or we look it up ourselves, of course. So there's like OU, CRC, um, OK, Rabbi Fox, of course, and maybe one other. So we actually say they're all reliable. 
So we're going to take the most lenient position because we have no reason not to, because we know they're all reliable, unless it's like something way out there. Believe me, the OU is only on the other direction. The OU tends to, you know, be machware and everything. So more stringent. Okay. Now, sinks, I feel like, is the trickiest. And first of all, okay, two things, sorry. Porcelain sinks cannot be kashered. Everybody with me on that? I have a stainless steel sink. I am very lucky. Stainless steel sinks can be kashered. You cannot kosher a porcelain sink for whatever reason. You can't. Therefore, you have to use this little cute picture that I put in. That's an insert. The insert generally has a hole in it. And then you put a trap in the, like a little, you know, is that called a trap? A little metal thing that has holes in it. Like a drain or something? Like drain, a drain, yeah, like what you put in the drain. Um, by the way, I just, you cannot kosher the, that little thing because it has a funny lip and it has little holes. So just get a new one for $5 or whatever for Pesa. That is not easy. Although theoretically you could drop it into boiling water and it should be okay, but there are differing opinions on that, but it's not expensive enough really to worry about, I think. But in any case, if you have a stainless steel sink, again, you can kosher it, but you have, because you're going to use boiling water, you must let it wait for 24 hours. Now that's the heart with cold water only. Sorry. You can't let heat. The problem is that if you turn on your microwave, that's heat. If you turn on your, your, uh, what else is it? Dishwasher, that's heat. The sink you still want to use. It's very hard not to use your sink for 24 hours uh, for cold water because you're used to using hot. So this year it's easier because you could do it on Shabbat and then you have 24 hours and let's say Shabbat, you could just kosher your sink. Um, so that's good. The You can only use cold water. The way I do it is somebody taught me this trick many years ago. Here, I put it in here. A few start a few days for Pesach in case you forget and use hot water because then you won't be able to kosher it. And you have to reset the clock on the 24 hours. So it's helpful to put a plastic bag with a rubber band over the faucet handle so that'll remind everyone to use only cold water for 24 hours. Now in my home, because it's a very small home, there are two, two and a half apartments basically, like one teeny apartment and two, just this. and there's a Jewish person in one of the other apartments we can't use hot water on Shabbat. So we never use hot water on Shabbat anyway. So so we only use cold water the whole Shabbat. So this year it'll be easy. Matzai Shabbat will come. We didn't use cold water. We didn't use hot water, I mean. And we'll just kosher it after Shabbat. But for people in apartment buildings where there are many non-Jewish people, then there is a heter for you to turn on hot water on Shabbat because you could assume that a non-Jewish person is activating the hot water. Remember, we're not allowed to put hot water on Shabbat because when hot water runs into the tank, sorry, when cold water runs into the tank, it gets heated and you're not allowed to heat water on Shabbat. But anyway, what I was trying to say is whenever you want to start your 24 hours, make sure you put a plastic bag or something so that everybody will be, you might remember, but it's very easy to forget for 24 hours not to put the hot water on. Then what do you do? You take boiling water, you take it from, let's say, an instant hot water thing or whatever you want, your Shabbat thing, it doesn't matter. You pour boiling water over the whole surface. Generally, we don't do it directly from the hot water urn, right? We pour it into something and then pour it on there. But it has to still be boiling, so do it immediately. Pour it over everything, the faucet, the sink, everything, and it is good for, for Pesach. May, I, may I ask a question? Yes, of course. Okay. So, so I have a question concerning, yeah, and I apologize if this was answered already. We have an insert that we use for Pesach, a, a sink insert that fits right into the sink. And uh, your sink, what is your sink made of, Peter? Um, uh, gosh, I'm thinking. Uh, is I it guess, stainless steel or is it no, porcelain? no. Uh, I think is it's it porcelain. So when it's porcelain, that's what I said. You may have missed that. You cannot kosher a porcelain sink. No, no, I'm not going to kosher it. We're going to sidestep it by putting a totally different Correct. sink liner into exactly. it. Exactly. That's what you need to do. You need to put in a sink, 100%. Okay, a brand new sink, which we both I don't know if it has to be brand new. If you can save it from year to year, that's your choice. But yeah, you have yeah, to that's put an insert have. into your sink if you have a porcelain sink. Right. So that's we a word to the wise insert. when you're renting or buying, use stainless steel. Okay. <laughs> you can. 
Very good, Peter. Thank you. Judy, Judy, Thank and then... You. I have a question that has to do with a lot of this stuff about cushering. So you said, you know, you don't have to pour it directly into anything, pour it into something, then pour the boiling water into No, what I said was, how are you going to hold your hot water urn, which is awkward, and yeah. then pour open the spout? It's just, you could Okay, so you have yourself. to pour it into something and then pour it in, pour. Yeah, put it into a Pyrex thing or into something. No, that might, that's exactly my question. Is it you pour it into a Pesadica thing? I hear what you're saying. So that's my question. You have to pour it into a paste a Pyrex thing or a paste a pot and then pour it. And that, that's what I was asking about kashering things. You put it into a pot. To kosher it, is that pot supposed to be kosher for Pesach or not? We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. So that's a good question. I use my instant hot water kettle. So I just lift it and pour it. So I don't have that. I don't know if it makes a difference if it's clean and let's say it's glass like Pyrex. That's a really good question if it has to be Pesach thick or not. I, I'm going to have to get back to you on that and I will answer it in the WhatsApp group. Okay, thank you. Sure, that's a great question. So yeah, I Anna, wanted to, you had a question. Right. Yeah, so first of all, I was thinking you could probably use any metal water kettle at the same time, also, if you want to you own that. one, if you, if you own one, one. if you don't, that's also, um, I'm just also assuming that, um, the enamel, like enamel covered iron sinks are considered like porcelain as well. Correct. That is yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Good sure. question. You have to have an insert. Yep. I mean, you still want to clean it and it gets kind of yucky over Pesa. Yes. Andrea. Can you use the steamer? I don't think you can use a steamer on the sink, but you can use it on the countertops. I don't know if you can use it on the sink. I do boiling water on the sink. I I don't feel like it's going to really get every part. The countertops is a lot easier to do it, to put it on the counter. Especially, honestly, countertops, you never cook boiling hot food on a countertop. And if you do, then you really need to kosher it. But how many people cut boiling hot chametz on their countertop, you put it on a cutting board. Okay, great. Continuing, any other questions? Okay, let's continue. All right, um, the urn we spoke about, remember what I wrote, a clean well inside out, run through with boiling water once and let out. If there's a spigot, pour boiling water over it. If it was cleaned at times with vinegar, wipe well, run through, wipe again and pour boiling water on the spigot. We had a problem with that because you could have put it through with vinegar that theoretically you usually you don't use it. Yeah. But if it was cleaned with vinegar, you want to make sure it's very, very clean. Now, if you use it to heat challah, some people do that, and it got hot, that could be a problem because then you're literally putting chametz on your hot water urn. My hot water urn doesn't get hot on top, so it's it's plastic. So it does. I don't have enough. I can't. Um, you know, heat anything on it. Kettles on the stove should be cleaned and then rest for 24 hours in case food splattered on them, filled with water, heated till boiling. An electric hot plate. So you can't kosher it, um, but you can, one second, but does allow you to use any type of year-round. Okay, this is the process. This is not a koshering process, but it allows you, you clean it well and leave it unused for 24 hours. And here's a hack that I think I came up with. Just use on it underneath as a double layer, a disposable tin. And they come in all sizes. So whatever it is that you're putting, just put another layer underneath it. And then there's no way, you're not cooking on there, right? Right? So you're just keeping it clean because the problem is, again, if you put tin foil on it, it can be very, very unsafe. But um, do not eat any food that falls on an uncovered and uncoshered plata. Plata meaning electric right? An electric hot plate like people use for Shabbat. Just buy some disposable tins and use them as a second layer. And then there's no chance that anything that might have come on the plata could jump into your food. Metal blechs, these are flat pieces of metal used to cover an open flame. They can be kashered by cleaning well, leaving unused for 24 hours and placed on top of lit burners for 30 minutes. I'm not 100% sure why it needs to be 
left for 24 hours if it's being um uh the 24 hours i don't know i actually don't know why it shouldn't be 24 hours that i might have to i mean it doesn't matter usually you have 24 hours you didn't use it but i don't know why you have to wait 24 hours i'm going to ch double check on that because if it's by libun which is burning you don't wait 24 hours and if you just cleaned it well just make sure you don't eat any food that fell on it that's all i mean you're taking a pot on and off Okay, warming drawers, that's my new one for this year. I never had a warming drawer and I never got a question about a warming drawer till now. Anybody here have one? No. No, nobody has one. You have one. Sabina has one. Okay, one second. Somebody sent a chat. I have to go. Oh, okay. All right. Somebody said she had to go. That's not a problem. Okay. Um, so if you have a warming drawer, Sabina, did you did, did have you used it in the past for Pesach? I don't hear you. You're muted, Samita. It holds trays and stuff, you know, like, um, or, you know, stuff I don't use. I don't use it as a warming drawer. So it's, Oh, it's you don't use it as a warming drawer. So I that, oh, you just, storage, as a storage, storage, storage. So that's not relevant. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so relevant. the major kashrut organizations say that you you shouldn't kashrut or you're kashrut putting sterno fuel in it or something really dangerous. But Rabbi Fox said that he doesn't see a problem and anybody who wants to, it is in our file. I don't need to go over it for the people on Zoom because nobody here has a warming drawer, but the information is right here. Barbecue. The whole barbecue unit needs to be well cleaned, including the inside, the hood, and all knobs and levers so that no pieces of food are left. That's hard. Leave unused for 24 hours. Place aluminum foil on top of the grate, shiny side down, and run the grill on high for about an hour. And you could use disposable barbecues. And again, I'm going to... Maybe it's because it's almost impossible to clean a barbecue. Um, I don't know why you have to wait 24 hours. I'm going to check on that and I will make sure to follow up on that in this file. Mixers, blenders, food processors. All right. You can only use them for Pesach if you're able to fully clean all the components. If you have, now I've had mixers. Most mixers have kind of vents in them and flour gets inside. You cannot clean that. It's impossible. So that's not a possibility. Um, and that would only be if you could take out the motor assembly. But if you literally could clean every single piece and drop it in boiling water, the metal and the plastic, um, then you could use it. Because this is not, oh, you don't have to wait 24 hours. Sorry, because there's no heat. I apologize. There's no reason because it's not about heat here. Um, I, as far as I know, I'm not sure. I think, okay. Here's the thing for mixers and blenders. Again, like I had a mixer in Israel that had no exposed parts. It's a Bosch. It's an amazing mixer. My daughter inherited it from me. She loved it. I loved it. It has a cover on it. It's amazing. I just bought another bowl for Pesach and I used the engine. It was great. But it was no problem cleaning it because it was no exposed parts. There's no way for flour to seep inside or come out again. But, you, but there's a problem. Can you get it clean enough? So you really have to look at it and you could use a food processor, for example, for breadcrumbs, right? Somebody, I used to use, I used to make breadcrumbs. So you can use it for hummus. It's not only used for vegetables. Um, so you have to just know what you use it for to see if you can clean it well. And um, and then if you can really, really clean it, you still have to drop it into boiling water. So I have to check. Yeah, kasher, it says each metal piece individually through Hagala. Hagala is dropping it in boiling water. We have the process on top. We'll get to that. Um, but I don't know why you don't have to kasher the plastic piece. Mixer, food. I'm going to write that down as a question and maybe say it's good that I'm going through this. So, so Bracha, can you kasher plastic? You can if it's hard plastic that can withstand being dropped in boiling water for a few seconds. Most plastic can't withstand that. Okay. Okay. The electrical wires. The electrical wires. My, no, I'm okay. I'm not talking about the base. I'm talking about the plastic that you can take off. Yes. So good point, Milton. Don't put anything with electricity in there. Let's look at how you do Hagala. Uh, weird. Hagala. The theory of this process is just as chametz entered the vessel or utensil, so it will leave. As I said, what's the process? This is for anything you want. This is um, on page for Milton and Nancy, page two. Page two, it's at the beginning. First, I explain the process. Then I say which, which utensil, which item uses which process. 
So first cleaning them thoroughly, we allow the pots or utensils being kasher to stand unused at least 24 hours. The large pot in which you kasher the smaller utensils should also be 24 hours. Some have the custom to use a Pesach pot for the kashering or to kasher a non-Pesach pot first by filling it with water, heating it till boiling and overflowing sides of the pot. The CRC does not require the large vessel to be a Pesach pot. So Judy, that's your answer. Yeah, that's what I Some was Some people wondering say that you need is. that utensil it has to be completely clean, of course, and it has to wait for 24 hours. So when I have a hot water thing, it's not a problem. It just has hot water in it. The instant hot water, you know, the one that, that what's it called? The electric kettles. So that's not a problem. But if you're going to pour it into a glass and then kosher it, you might want to use a Pesach thick one. You might want to kosher it first. But all of the options are possible. The large vessel is filled with enough water to immerse the smaller items and brought to a rolling boil. The utensils or pots are then completely immersed in the large mm -hmm. vessel for 15 seconds or so. Now, the truth is, oh, well, you'll see in a minute. When koshering, the utensils should not touch each other, rather drop them in one by one. Mm -hmm. But larger or long utensils, as well as pots with handles, do not need to be immersed all at once, but can be done in parts. After koshering, all utensils, I'll turn off the lights. Bye, thank Bye. you. After koshering, all utensils are rinsed in cool water. And at this point, they are ready for use and are pariv. They are reset to zero. Did everybody follow that? You have a big pot on the stove and you have to fill it to boiling. Again, it has to have rested for 24 hours. No problem using a Pesach pot covers all possibilities. That's fine. You have a big soup pot, you could use that. And then you you also, the, the things you are koshering, whether in metal, let's say. So metal would be like forks, knives, spoons, or I don't know what else would be metal that you might be koshering. You have metal cups. I'm talking about metal. Silver. Oh, so, but not Kiddush cup. cup. Oh, Kiddush Cup. Ah, we're going to get to Kiddush Cups. Ah, I love it. The Kiddush Cup is one of my favorites to talk about. Okay, everybody got me. And then you you will let everybody rest. Everything rests for 24 hours. And then you immerse it for about 15 seconds. You take it out, rinse it in cold oh, water. And it is Pesach thick and Parib. All Just right? What about capturing um, a smaller pot inside a bigger pot and the bottom of the small pot has a little uh, corrosion? I don't see a problem except that, are you sure you want to use that pot? <laughs> the inside of the pot is shiny. And I don't see a problem. But the uh, outside, they must have burned. I don't see it. a problem with that. I, it's actually the inside that's more of an issue than the outside anyway, but I don't see a problem. Unless there's a crack, if there's a crack, you're not using it anyway. Oh, no. I might have missed it, but um, and the pans and pots that are coated are cannot be koshered. Coated or, yeah. with what? Teflon or that's fine. That's metal. Teflon, even so, if it's scratch Teflon and it doesn't get it, I, mean, I don't. I know. First of all, you should not use scratch Teflon. You should throw it away. It's actually okay. dangerous. It has nothing to do with Pesach. You should actually okay, okay. toss it. Now okay. again, what are you koshering? Most people have Pesach thick pots. But sometimes you have a pot that you say, oh, no, I I, I need one more pot. I don't know. It's not common to cash your pots anymore because pots are not expensive. Yeah. The door got locked. Um, utensils, like sometimes silverware needs to be koshered. And I'm about to get to Kiddush Cups. But so, first- Brock, I just want to ask something. Something that reminds me about, yeah, you had to put something into the boiling water so it boiled over the side. Do you remember Yeah, that, that thing about putting about a stone. stone. Yeah, what I've was learned about? that you don't need to do that. That's for koshering the pot itself, not for dipping in. Uh, in okay. other words, if you needed to kosher a pot that doesn't fit into another pot, uh -huh. Then you need to put like you heat a stone or a little rock you put or metal, a screw, and then it boils over. Of course, that's a huge mess. Yes, huge. it, it usually is. puts out the fire. It could be dangerous. I'm not saying, you know, it's yeah. it's not a simple thing. So if somebody has a big pot like that, please speak to me. I'm not so sure I want you to do it. I have another another idea for you, but I don't want to discuss it here. OK, baby bottles. If the formula is chametz, then look for new formula and new bottles for Pesach, obviously. If your baby can only eat chametz and can't eat anything else, they can eat it. But first you want to look for kidney oats. I mean, in Israel, it's a thing to make soups and make things into a mush and, and open the nipple and have kids drink from the bottle. America, it's not so common. But you could have oat cereal that you, 
you gave them in there that, or you thicken your formula with oatmeal, rice is less of an issue. It's kidney oat. Babies can certainly have kidney oat. Soy-based formula is fine. But if you had real chametz, unless your baby has to have chametz for health reasons, get a new bottle and, you know, something else. Now, if you use kidney oat formula on Pesach, the bottle should be rinsed clean in the bathroom or in a kitchen sink without other utensils because you don't want to pass the kidney oat taste. Then they can be washed with other Pesach dishes in the sink or the dishwasher. You just want to get rid of the actual food by itself. If year-round bottles were used for kidney oat or were washed with other utensils, I mean, in the sink or dishwasher. I mean, there's also things if you have, you can look at this if you have a bottle. High chair, tray, booster seat, or anything else, clean well with the cleaner. Do not use it for 24 hours before Pesach for hot food. Remember, hot food. You can use it. It's not for hot food because it actually, theoretically, a baby, I mean, usually you don't get them some hot food, but they could get it all over the place. Most people don't pour hot food on their chairs. I'm back on number 23, Nancy. Coffee makers, all types, including French presses, Keurig machines, and coffee grinders that have only, only been used with unflavored coffee can be used on Pesach. Wash and clean well. Let's sit for 24 hours, do haga'ala on any metal parts, meaning boiling water, pour hot, hot water through the glass portions. Basically, you just make coffee without the coffee. But if it had flavored coffee, you generally cannot kosher it. Generally, unless you can drop it in hot wa boiling water, but can't do that with a curd machine. So I only use unflavored coffee, so it's not a problem. If you use flavored, you have to discuss it. All right, we're using a few more here. Countertops. Well, I'm on number still, eight. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I don't know because it's decaf. Decaf is a problem. It's decaf. We're yeah, decaf can be a problem on Pesach. Um, Nancy and Milton, we're on number eight. Countertops. Rach, I have a question. It's Wendy. Yes, Wendy. If you use, if you brewed on very rare occasion, decaf coffee, not flavored, but I know decaf, I know for Pesach, decaf I must don't have know. its own health care. I think if we have to look it, at it and check it. I don't know. Okay, my understanding, and I am so I may be wrong, is that you could you you cash it, you run through like an empty, you wash it completely, possible, and then yeah. run through. It's possible. That sounds like it makes sense. Right. Like not use it for twenty four hours, but I know it's a problem. So maybe if it's just decaf, I don't know if decaf is chametz or if it's kidney oat. Mm. I just don't know. Mm. So if somebody has a specific question, please come to me or Rip Steven or Rip Asar or whoever, and then we'll look into it for you, okay? Okay, thank you. Countertops, because we've done everything. We haven't gotten to dishes. We got to countertops. All surfaces should be cleaned and then pour or steam boiling water on the surface. All countertops, with the exception of porcelain, can be made acceptable for Pesach if they can be cleaned. Marble stone for mica, Jerusalem stone, wood. If you really clean it, what's my... um. There is a prevalent custom to cover countertops even if after they have been kashered, although it is not halachically necessary. Let's take a show of hands. Anybody here counter, cover their counters? Ooh, a lot of people. So you should just know, no issue, but you don't have to. You don't have to. You can do what you want, but you don't have to. Yes, Fran. Uh, yeah, I have here um, this cafe taster's choice decaf and it says kosher for Pesach, Parva. Yeah, but you have, right. So it has to say kosher for Pesach, and you can't right. just assume that, yes, great. Oh, no, great, I would Okay, misunderstood. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, so, so if and I, then so Carol, I one second, them, one second, one second. Wait, Sabina, then Carol. Yep. Yeah, I was told that if you have a quartz countertop, which is totally non-porous, as long as you clean it thoroughly, it's fine. It's not, it's, yeah. Right. Right. It's not, so it's not stone that's going to absorb anything. It's exactly. Totally so absorbed. there's different, right? So you could look at different materials. Some people don't. Some people just, if there's no cracks in it, then you can, you don't, I mean, again, if you don't ever put hot boiling, hot comments on it, it can't really absorb. But remember, we said we're extra careful. And the kitchen is a place where there's a lot, a lot of food. So we often take that steamer. I happen to have a steamer, so it's very nice. Um, but if you got that sock, Sabina, that's beside the as long as you rely on the person. When you say a steamer, you mean the thing that you use to steam clothes because you don't want to iron? Um, it's like I don't know how to explain it. It it has water coming out, and you can just pat. Yeah, I guess so. It's, okay. We we don't use it for ironing clothing. We use it for the countertops. We inherited it from somebody. Yeah. Um, Carol. 
So, uh, so granite would be in that category. Is that that just porcelain was not, I think. Oh, um, <laughs> Let me check you, again. You count if I, I, I got, for the first time in many years, I'm making Pesach in New York. So all my Pesach stuff is in Florida, basically. And in Florida, I always covered my counters because they were for mica. But now I know I don't have to. So can I now not cover my counters? I'll feel so percent Clean them. <laughs> Cash with that. I mean, do the boiling water and don't cover. I think for Micah, you can. Why do you say for it's Micah, on, you can't yeah, cash it? It's on the list, but um, I don't know. Somehow I thought you couldn't. All countertops, that. with the exception of porcelain, can be made acceptable for Pesach if they can be cleaned. Marble right. stone for Micah. So even in, in yeah. Florida, you should be able to, you don't have to cover them. And I have a stainless steel sink in Florida, too. Ooh, nice. I'm nice. here. <laughs> that I have. You, th you see, Carol, you should have stayed in Florida. for. I me. know. I don't have any pots and pans here. I'm going to have to kosher something. <laughs> ah, so you really have a reason to kosher. So we'll talk about it. All right. Drinking glasses. Drinking glasses that were only used for cold. Is there any way for it to be chametz sick? Oh, you, you soak it in water for 24 hours, right? Three times and change the water. That one, Carol? That's something like that. We don't have to. That is, yeah. oh. it used to be done. There is no, no, I also did it as a child. My mother did it. There is no need. It cannot absorb hummets because it is not being, hot. unless you put hot oatmeal in it. If you put hot oatmeal in it, then it's a problem. But if you use it for cold, and that's why you don't have to do anything to a Kiddush cup. Guess what? Kiddush mm. wine and grape juice is actually Pesach thick all year round. There is no way to make your Kiddush cup hummet stick unless you literally use it for something other than Kiddush. What about what? That's good for Passover borscht. Borscht? I don't know. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So you you just have to clean your Kiddush cups. You probably don't even put them in the dishwasher. You don't even have, not that it makes a difference. Just clean them and they're ready for pay. They're actually Pesach thick all year round, just like the wine is Pesach thick all year round. You know, and it doesn't matter what your Kiddush cup is made out of. You only use it for cold kasha le Pesach. And also your drinking glasses. I only put cold drinks in my drinking glasses. There is no way for the glass to absorb chametz. So I hope you I'm wash your mind. The, you wash the kid, or I do. I wash the kiddush cup with other, with chametz, with food, with dishes, with the same sponge that may have had something on it. Wendy, were you here at the beginning when we spoke about the ice cube trays? Yes. Ah, so it's the same. What if it's ceramic? If what it doesn't matter, it doesn't it doesn't Kiddush matter. Cup. You can't infuse hummets from your sponge. You're not cooking the you're not cooking food. It's not hot enough to cook it. You're not actually infusing the taste of hummets from your sponge. No matter how I mean, unless you sat it in a, you'd have to literally have a, a basin of hummets of oatmeal and cook it in it to make it. But that's not how we do it. If you want to that. tell me that you used your drinking glass or your kiddush cup with hot hummets, boiling hot hummets, that it could no. cook, yeah, then it's a problem. But that's not the way we do it. Okay. Okay. Anna. So, but what about when it's in the sink, you know, and you're pouring soup and the soup splashes into it because we do things in our, you know, in our sink with it, it doesn't right, but, matter, including so, also. I mean, I think people are pretty careful about glasses and kiddush cups and don't usually put them. But again, it's not cooking it. It might have splashed on it, but it can't be hot enough to cook and infuse it. And not okay, so and the dishwasher. I mean, I don't put my kiddush cup in the dishwasher, but like for the glasses, though, not a problem. They don't absorb hummus. OK. And I know it's really it's it's a thing. So Brooke, uh, is there a difference between glass and Pyrex? The way yes, you, you, but Pyrex, you know, but that we didn't even get to Pyrex yet. Um, Pyrex is a is something you cook in. You don't cook in your cold drinking glasses, but you and actually Pyrex I think cannot be. I'm That's not sure. I'm asking. Be yeah, I thought I'm it about couldn't to... be kosher for, for Pesa. No, Pyrex. I don't think you can kosher Pyrex for Pesa. Right. Okay, fire glass that goes in the oven or microwave. Oops, it can be kashered with the agala. There you go. But let's read what it says. This only works for glass that is strong enough to withstand the heat, such as acrylic and corel. 
There are three appro okay, there are three approaches to glass. Some treat glass as though it does not absorb, therefore only needs to be rinsed. So that's Sephardic. Some treat glass like metal and therefore can be kashered with Hagala if it can withstand the boiling hot water for 15 seconds. Some treat gas glass like earthenware, which cannot be kashered. And Rab Melamed, who is an excellent posake, Rab Eliezer Melamed, Paskins like the middle position for all adult Ashkenaz Sephard. He says, you as long as you can, as long as you can um put it in boiling hot water, you can kosher it. So there you go. There's the answer. See, I didn't even remember from last year. So ah. it says what glass pyrex that has not been used. No, glass or pyrex that here's the three days. Because you put food in it and it might, I guess, have gotten caught. That you do have to kosher by soaking in water for three days, changing the water, but only if it hasn't been used with hot food. If it has uh, See, here's the thing. I, I don't know what to tell. There's glass and then there's oven tempered glass. So if you need to kosher, I mean, look, today, thank God, like usually you just buy a new set of Pyrex. But if you absolutely need to, you have to carefully look at my instructions here. There's glass, there's tempered glass, and it depends on whether it's used with hot food or not used with hot food. You can read it here, okay? It's very clear what you have to do. Plastic, hard plastic often used with children can be kosher through Hagala meaning you, as long as you can dunk it in boiling water. Hard plastic storage containers can be kosher through Hagala. These are different from the single-use plastics, which actually melt. As a matter of fact, we put one of them in the freezer and it broke as soon as we took it out. Silverware and small cookware, silverware, small pots and metal or hard plastic utensils may be kosher through Hagala, boiling water. And even those with handles can be kosher as long as it can withstand boiling water. Cut coat knives, once clean, may be kosher through Hagala. Large, here we go. Here you go, Judy. It was here for you. Larger pots and kettles may be kosher by following the preparatory steps described above. Filling them to the top with water, which you then bring to a boil. You have to force the water to spor spill over the rim and it gets messy. Traditionally, a, heating, a heated stone is used for the process. However, covering the pot with a cover works just as well because mm -hmm. it boils over. But notice that your gas will probably go out and have to be relit, so it's dangerous. Um, anything which was used in a non-liquid cooking process, baking, roasting, broiling, frying without oil, can only be kashered through firing. They, oh, libun chazak, strong firing, which would burn up the chametz. If you have a self-cleaning oven, you can put these pans in. They cannot all withstand it. It's not a simple option to kasher like challah trays. It's not simple because they're used without water, so you can't you can't release the chametz with water. Um, if they can withstand the heat, you can put in the oven on its highest setting. I wouldn't recommend putting them on the self-clean. Mm -hmm. Frying pans. Everybody, if you're on, just go on mute if you're speaking. If a frying pan is primarily used with oil, it can be kashered through libun kal, light heating. After cleaning the pan, unused 24 hours, it should be heated to a temperature where an easily combustible manner, matter will singe when it touches it. If this will break the pan, you can use it through a gala. Anyway, you can read it yourself. Um, if the pan is primarily used with a spray, it can only be used kasha through what we call libun kal, which is, means you have to heat it to a very hot. So it's not simple. Like, you know, you're running a risk. It's not safe. And the question is, can you afford to buy a frying pan? So buy one frying pan. Just a suggestion. If you have an issue, reach out to one of us. We'll go over the process with you. Um, things that cannot be Passover kasha, china, pottery, earthenware, porcelain, anything that cannot be cleaned uh, like a sieve. So that's what we were talking about. That's what he was saying, that little strainer where the water goes through in the trap, it has little holes and we assume it can't well, be well cleaned. Treat a glass Pyrex, Corning Revisions, decanters for storing whiskey. Interesting, I guess not glass. And uh, we did countertops. Let's see if there's anything else that we're missing. We went through everything actually. And you can go back. I mean, I mean, it's all in the file. The most important thing to remember is that dirt is not chametz and cleaning for Pesach is not spring cleaning. The entire home still should be back in for chametz. Check for chametz in any place where food can be. So we said this, what Wendy said before, under couch cushions and handbags, school bags. Um, remember to, M oh, we assume that any food that has fallen on the floor behind a bed, desk, or bookcase is no longer edible. So you don't have to move your furniture. Remember to empty the vacuum bag and throw away garbage bags that have chametz in them. And best to spritz it with a teeny bit of bleach or throw it into a municipal bin so you it won't belong to you when you throw it away your Pesach. And the last thing is you need to sell your chametz. So go to our, um, you should gather your chametz in one place. It could be in the fridge, could be in the freezer, 
Could be in a, just a, behind the door. Mark it, close it, lock it. You have to note all those locations when you sell your hummets. We have a link to this and on our website. Huh. And that's okay, and the way you do it, folks. A question, a crazy yeah. question. Dog food. Ah, food is on Wednesday. Good night, guys. Oh, it's it Wednesday. Is? Wednesday, what time is when? What time? 7.45, same time. Is it the same link? Same link. Okay. Judy, it's not a crazy question I was going to ask. Not you. at all a crazy question. None of these questions are crazy if you don't know the answer. Right. That is my motto. Questions are always legitimate because if you don't know the answer, it's a legitimate question. And I really mean that. I, I really and truly mean that. That's why I treat every question with the same um, gravi gravity and relevance. If you don't know the answer, then it's then it's by definition it, it's a it's a relevant and important question. And I much prefer that people ask me questions and I can debunk myths. But it's not your fault if you don't know that it's a myth. And maybe I'll say no. Actually, that one's a problem. Okay. Okay. Latoya, hello. I didn't see you. All Thank right. Thank you so much. It was Thank awesome. Any so questions? Much, Rabbi Rabbi go Rabbi. on. You're so welcome. Thank you, Judy, for saying Rabbi Rabbi Rabbi. And um, it's on our website. It's on our WhatsApp. Join our WhatsApp. It's great. You can ask questions. Ask your friends can join our WhatsApp. We don't limit it to. We don't limit it to um, by members. Anybody. I mean, you don't have to be a paid member to join our WhatsApp, but you have to apply. You have to reach out to me, and I have to like vet you because we had a problem with our previous one. Somebody came on and posted horrible, obscene pictures. So since then, we we vet people and they have to do it through me, which is fine. Um, and ask your questions. And I know people here have used the WhatsApp to ask questions. And I encourage you to use it because then other people may have the same question or not even realize they have a question. So I'm always appreciative when people ask questions or say, oh, I saw this here. You can get it here. That's also helpful. Somebody couldn't get almond milk. You can't get almond. You shouldn't use almond milk. That's not kosher lepesa if possible. And somebody said, oh, I found it here. So that's helpful. Because people use soy milk and don't eat kidney oats, you need a substitute. Okay. All right, friends. Wednesday, if you want, come again. We'll talk about food. Thank you. Love Good to night. all be well. Good Thank night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. So welcome. <laughs>